Harry Messon, popularly known as DLM, is a seasoned startup builder who currently leads a fast rising venture studio. He has worked with over 250 SMEs and 15 tech startups across the world, where he helped build their ideation and spin out strategies and raised over $10 million for their scale up. David Larry Messon, DLM, is a multiple award winner and was recently named one of the 2020 top CEOs in Nigeria by Top 10 Magazines and a 2022 academic visitor at James Curry Society in cooperation with African Studies Center, Oxford University. The LM's outstanding work have been featured on Harvard Business School blog, African Leadership Magazine, Wikipedia, Nigeria Investment Promotion Council, ETC, the LM's degree and certificate based education span across Lagos State Polytechnic, Nexford University, Harvard Business School, Scalable Global Academy, and University of London. Um, so um, the idea of fundraising, I mean, um, my background has been in fundraising for, for profit businesses and all of that. But of course, um, in the previous years, I've, I've, I've sort of uh, played a little bit within the social enterprise sector and um, kind of have a bit of idea about how things play out. But um, if you are looking at raising funds, there are several ways to raise funds. Uh, in my own opinion, I've been able to also look at it from two perspectives that sometimes you might you might have to um, adopt um, strategies within the for-profit sector particularly when it comes to commercializing a few things around your not for profit work because oftentimes i always say that how do you keep your social profit or be a social impact project you know sustainable and in talking about sustainability it's important to look at an aspect of your project or what you are doing that you can commercialize so that that can sort of also help you to raise some type of funding that can enable you run the not-for-profit segment of what you are doing so um so i basically will be talking about pitching and fundraising for your digital business what do you need to do so um so what are digital businesses Digital businesses are businesses that operate a tech-focused business model. Nearly every company that springs up today begins operation with a digital business model. Uber is a digital business, and so are Jumia, Flutterway, Spotify, Google, and all of that. But in the context of social enterprise, um, it's important for you to know that the positioning of your social enterprise plays a very important role in securing funding for your organization, which means that you need to create some type of presence not just presence, but even an operational presence, so that if you are asking for funds, whether to you know lead on your for um, your sustainable you know segment of what you are doing, or for the non-profit side of what you are trying to do, those you are asking these funds for can make what I call blind inquiries about you. I will be able to find that information without having to come to you. What that does for you is that it kind of validates your existence, it validates your credibility within that space, and which is very important because you are not, uh, people want to invest in people that don't have to be present to answer questions all the time. People want to be able to trust you without having to come to you. They want to be able to find things online about you or even from people that they are going to ask questions and all of that. They will say, oh yeah, we know them and all of that. We've done a couple of stuff, check their website, see their operational structures and all of that that will kind of uh, enable you to you know gain the confidence of those who will um, you know make that commitment into whatever it is that you're trying to do so um one why should you go digital with what you are doing with um, your project technology has become an integral part of our life and it has become a part of everything that we do so for whatever it is that we are doing today you must understand that um um technology plays a fundamental role and why am i am i talking about digital first i'm talking about digital first because for you to be able to attract funding there are a few things that you need to put in place so those things that you need to put in place are now things i need to discuss with you so that when you put those things in place you will be able to attract the right kind of you know investors or social impact investors that can put the funding in your project to sort of move on 
And we must be very, very, um, um, we must take cognizance of the fact that whether you are for profit or not for profit, when investors give you money, they expect some form of return. That return might be um, some form of profit or what I call return on investment or social impact or data sort of. So if, for example, USAID is giving you funding for your project, they will expect that you provide them data, you provide them statistics of what you are trying to do because they need that data to be able to process global information. And that is why they are now investing in you at a local level so that it's easier for you to, you know, um, it's easier for them to have access to that data through your organization, which means that that is their own return, even though it is not financial, but it is it kind of contributes to their own expectations and bottom line, you know, as it stands. I'll be very open to questions if you ask me questions in between. I'll, 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 I'll be glad, you know, to, to, to answer those questions. So with the internet bridging, bringing people from around the world together, digital businesses are exposed to millions and possibly billions of potential customers. You are no longer restricted to a certain geographical area. By automating manual processing, you get to save time and businesses time. And you have to note that time is money with whatever it is that you are trying to, you know, you know, do. So what technology also does for you, why it is important for you to take whatever it is that you are doing, you know, digital, go digital with it is because it also helps you to lower operational, you know, cost. So when it comes to fundraising, I'm, I'm going to be using the model of not for profit. For you to be able to understand a few things when it comes to you know um fundraising for your startup so one when it, when should you actually fundraise you should fundraise when you have an operational structure in business in the business sector it's called a viable business model an operational structure as an organization helps you to understand how you deliver your programs as a not-for-profit how you measure your programs how you evaluate your programs how you kind of record the impact of what your programs for your um, your not for profit project. It's also important for you to know your target market. In business, it's called the good market size. It's for you to know your target and to know how you will be able to identify them where they are and what their experiences are. That way, you are able to clearly articulate their problems versus the solution that you are preferring to the investor because whoever is going to invest in you, whether the donor or the investor, they will want to clearly understand that you know what exactly you are talking about, the problem you are solving, you clearly understand it, and the solution that you have actually prepared, you also clearly understand it. Now, there's something called the MVP in business, which is also called the minimum viable product. It's important to note that you can't do everything at the same time when you are trying to get into that not-for-profit space. Your funder wants to know that you have started, you have a bigger picture of what you want to do, but you have started the smaller version of what you want to do. And that smaller version of what you are doing or that you have created, that you can, that people are experiencing, the, the, the target that you are reaching, they are experiencing it, and you are measuring impact and gathering data through that small project or that small impact project that you are putting together you know within the target space that you are operating in which also we call for what i call participation in business called good traction so once you have steady participation by this target it sort of clearly also help you to know that see there is interest in what we are doing and as such we can scale it or even take it from one area to the other and that way you can tell your funder that see we are doing this for example in Marco. We want to be able to take it to Ibutimeta, we want to take it to Ajegule, Ajegule, we want to take it to um, Ojo, we want to take it to Ajangbadi, and all of that. That way, they are able to clearly understand that you are scaling the impact of your project because you have now understood those that you are reaching. And all of these things are important before they can begin to say, okay, take money. So it's important for you to know some things before you sort of, you know, um, 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 fundraise. Another thing is that you must also know other people that are doing what you are doing so that you are able to innovatively craft, you know, the ideas that will differentiate you from what other people are trying to do within the space that you are going into because they want to see what, how are you delivering differently what you are doing. And fundraisers, when you are raising funds, 
funders are interested in all those type of uh, um, um, items. So, um, in in the not for profit space, that's what we call the grant proposal. You know, and um, when you are developing a grant proposal, just like you develop a deck. I always will say that it's important before you develop the comprehensive proposal, you develop a document called the grant summary. Now, summary it consists of the overview of the problem. It kind of also addresses the solution that you are bringing to addressing that problem. It also helps you to identify clearly the target that you are reaching and why, what you are solving the problem you are solving for them is very critical or very you know important to the funding that you are asking for it's also important for you to also give an overview of the area that you are doing that project you know and um, you need to also clearly state the figures that will play a role so let's take it from the context of a pitch for example a pitch is a short verbal presentation of a business idea to a potential investor or groups of investors aimed at arousing their interest. So how do you arouse the interest of your funder? You need to be able to say that, for example, that there are, for example, if you are trying to um, um, reach the girl child, maybe you are promoting girl child education, for example. You can say there are 20,000 girls within an area. And um, from that 20,000 girls, the about 15,000 of them do not have the opportunity to go to school because their parents do not have the resources to enable them to go to school. And they don't also have access to public schools because the public schools are probably very far from them. And as such, we have created what we call a bridge school to help them to learn while their parents go about their daily business and all of that. So it's important for you to clearly also, you know, state these things in your grant summary. And that way it kind of helps the, um, the funder or the investor to understand what it is that you are talking about and how to go about it. Now, a great pitch or a great summary, a grant proposal, a summary, she would be able to succinctly, you know, put together your points as to what you are doing, how you are doing it, what makes you different, and, um, you know, um, what you need to be able to deliver or scale what you are doing. And what impact will it bring? What are what are the projected impact that you think that what you are doing will bring? You know about with it, with, with with what if you get additional funding or some some more resources and all of that. You must be able to keep it very interesting. You must keep it enthusiastic. It must contain key numbers. You know, like the size of population that you're trying to target, the number of people that you truly want to target, and what impact will it bring? In the case of a business. It's, it's, it's going to basically be talking about the revenue and the sales and all of that. So your great pitch has, just like the grand summary, has the same qualities that have, you are seeing on the screen, such as you must clearly state your vision and unique value proposition, the problem you are trying to solve, the size of your target market, your solution to the problem, your go-to-market strategy. What is your strategy for implementation? In grant proposal, it's called implementation strategy. So what is your strategy for implementation? Then your traction, have you done it before? And who have you done it to? How many people did you reach? And why do you need money to be able to move? If you have done it to 100 people, but you have 15,000 people, you want to move from 100 to 15,000, which is why we are trying to request for them. But you must prove that you have done it and you can measure the impact in terms of the statistics. And that's what we call traction. You must also clearly state that this is what we have spent because your investor or your fund that wants to see a sense of accountability, what you're trying to do. So it's important for you to be able to state your financials in terms of how much did you spend. And you can also do what I call cost per person. How much did you spend to deliver that project to one person? You understand? That way, the vault funder can say, okay, if you are spending 1,000, if let's say you spend 20, 200,000 and you reach 100,000 people, it means that you have spent 20,000 um, or 2,000 on one person. So your funder can be like, okay, what about if you reach 100,000 people? Let's give you 2,000 times 100,000. If they're not looking at, at it from that perspective, they will also create a marginal concept in their head to know that, oh, if we invest X amount in this person, this person will be able to reach this X number of person. And don't forget, I mentioned earlier that data is very important in the case where a funder is giving you money and it's not expecting profit. Their own profit that they're expecting is that data. 
So the Moody will be able to calculate and project and say, if you will give you $1 million, $1 million will help us to reach 10 million people within X period of time. So these things are very important when it comes to, you know, seeking for funding from um, um, investors. Another way to look at is the competition. Clearly state your competition who is doing what you are doing so that that way they are able to see comparative analysis to what you are doing. They're able to compare and say, okay, if this person is doing the same thing in this area and is reaching X number of persons, that means that there's still a gap of people that has not been reached. That is why you are existing to be able to reach those type of people as well. And it also shows the cumulative impact of the data, you know, um, um, or, uh, to their interpretation of that. And again, we also will be looking at the team. You must also show that you have a fantastic team. A lot of times people write grant proposals without stating the quality of team that they've got. Then how do you convince the funder that you are indeed doing something that, um, that, um, um, that, will, that has value, but from a standpoint of the people that you have got, and not just only you, because if you present yourself as just only the person running that project, what it does to the investor or the funder is that it gives them a wrong impression about you and does not kind of prove to them that the concept will be sustainable if you are, for example, sick or something. You understand? Then you must also state how much money you are asking from in that document. And it must also be broken down that, oh, when you give us X amount of money, we will use this part of the money to do X, Y, Z. You understand? You should be able to clearly state it. That way they're able to understand your budget and know how much you really want to spend on what you are doing. Now, when it comes to raising money, it's important to position for success. You must approach only investors that have invested in companies that are similar to yours. Now, oftentimes we go to all manner of people without knowing that people have interest. Take, for example, we let us even take our companies that like to do CSR and you want to raise money from them. You need to take O&O, for example. O&O is only interesting, is interested in education-related projects. You need to do your research to be able to find out the people that will invest in you, what type of project are they interested in so that you are not wasting your time or wasting all of your energy in developing content that will not particularly be relevant to who you are trying to reach. It's important to do your research so that that way you're also able to customize your information, your proposal in a way that um, um, attends to the need of those who are reaching. Because you need to understand that it's a need by need um, concept or basis that you are operating on, which means that you need something, you must put at the back of your mind that those who are, you are going to reach are also in need of something and you must be able to articulate that in your document in such a way that it kind of fulfills their own expectations now. But, you know, you need to get your timing right. You must know, for example, you must know when um, in, in business called the opening of investment rounds. Investors open rounds at a particular time. You must know when rounds open. The same thing, you must know when organizations that call for proposals. You must know when they call for proposals. You must know when they expect that they will be able to treat proposals so that you don't just go to submit the right document at the wrong time. Another thing is that you have to be in constant contact with those who are seeking the funds from investors or the fund and all of that. You have to be in constant communication with you. That is not to say that you should bug them, but you may have to be able to do your checking. It kind of also just shows to them that, yeah, you are very actively involved. Now, for example, if you are checking in on them, don't check on them asking, oh, what have you, or oh, are you going to fund us or not? Give them like updates of what you have done between the period you submitted the proposal and the period that you are trying to reach them, that say, oh, I'm just following up, but in the last two weeks, we've been able to reach an extra 25 people. In our proposal, we stated that we reached, we reached only 40 people or we reached 100 people, but we, are reached, uh, we have reached extra 25 people in the last two weeks, and now we have reached 125. We are hoping that when we get the phone, we're able to scale from 125 to 2,500. So these things also, also kind of help them to validate or help them to consolidate upon the fact that you are actively involved in what you are doing and you are making impact despite the fact that they have not responded um, to you. So I, 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 I want to believe that um, um, in this very short time, I've been able to at least um, uh, mention a few points that will help you to structure your proposal in a way that will allow you to fundraise from the funders. But there are various other ways that you can I mean, people that you can raise from, for you can raise from from agencies, foundations, philanthropists. You can raise from from even investors. You can raise from who are interested in social impact. 
You can as well raise funds from corporate organizations that have CSRO department. You can raise funds from a collective of people who are just sort of focused on, you know, just solving, you know, problems, social problems within the society. You just have to keep your ears down and do your research and you'll be able to find this information. I'm hoping and believing that I've been able to make some impact with this um, presentation and I'll be open to questions. Thank you very much. I can't hear you from here, though. Okay, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. I said thank you very much for the amazing value that you have just delivered here today. So much in so short a time. We are really excited to have you once again. Uh, I, I heard you say something about blind inquiry. I believe a number of us would want to know what that really means. And if you can, you know, create some kind of context to it so that we fully understand. And so, also, uh, if you have, sorry, also, if you have questions, guys, just leave your questions in the comments and um, we are going to take your questions quickly. Okay, so over to you, sir. Thank you very much. So talking about blind inquiry, a lot of times when you prepare proposals, you must understand that um, um, people will check up on you. And if you are not positioned properly, like, for example, put your social media handles in place and let it be active. Take, for example, you open a social media handle and the last time you posted was in January. For the investor who is trying to check up on you, we see that you are not active and you are not focused on the goal of what you say you are representing. That is blind inquiry. But you won't be there when they'll be doing those inquiries about you. And as such, it's important to be actively involved. Recently, my company won a billboard advert opportunity and from the letter that they sent, they stated that we are giving you this because we checked your operational structure and checked your social media handle. We see that you are extremely very active. You do like four posts a day and all of that. For them, these are things that they will use to measure you. And these are these things are done based on blind inquiry. So they might look into your followers, for example, and then they can just pick 10 random followers and ask them questions about you and say, so please, you follow this organization would like to know if they, you've done stuff with them in the past or what do you know about them? They might say, oh, sorry, I did not know that I follow them. They have never, I'm, I'm not active with them. I'm so sorry. Someone say, oh, I know them. Oh, they've helped me. They helped my, my, my X, Y, Z to be able to achieve this and all of that. You get, so these things are very important. Now, another word you can call blind inquiries, background check. People are going to do background check on you. And when they are doing this background check, be rest assured that you are not present there. They are going to ask people, that you don't even know. And it is the perception, the position that you have created for your brand that will help you at that point. So it's important to continue to position your brand, your organization, and continue to create the right kind of perception. Give them updates about what you are doing. Tell them about your activities. Continue to inform people about what you're doing. Communication is very important. Content is very important. You have to be able to also keep that relationship with your contact. I call it the 3C model. Communicate, you understand? Turn out content and continue to be in touch with your content steadily. These things will help you to solidify blind inquiries when you are not present. Awesome, awesome. I love the way you put it. Um, it will help us solidify blind inquiry. You know, people are basically saying a lot of things behind closed doors, doors that we do not yet have access to. Thank you very much for this that you shared. So um, while we are waiting for you know, for the participant to turn in their questions. I have another question that I would like for you to, you know, um, put in context, right? You said something about a minimum viable product. So um, how does that apply to a non-profit? So a minimum viable product is, is um, the smallest feature that in immediately creates the most direct impact for those we are trying to reach. So let us say in business, I'm going to come to non-profit in, in a for-profit context. Imagine you want to, you want to manufacture a car that has computing in it, has a lot of functionalities in it and all of that. And then you have never put that car out before. 
So what do you need to do? You need to first of all put a four-wheel car out first without the features. So putting that four-wheel car out without the features shows that you have shown to people that see, I want, I'm creating something on four wheels, but I've not added everything that will be part of it. But I want you to come and experience it because it's going to move you forward. Do you understand? Now, yeah. that means you have achieved the question of movement. The next thing is to now do is to now begin to achieve the question of comfort. Then you can now move it a step forward and now begin to achieve the question of luxury. But all of these things will come one after the other. But the beginning part of it is the MVP. In the context of a not-for-profit, let us say that you are looking at reaching girls in, girls in less privileged areas and you want them to go to, you want to create a school for them. But you don't have the money to create a school. How about if you start with, first of all, recruiting these girls and either placing them in school, different schools, but they are your candidates. Now, what you have done automatically is that you have recruited them, placed them in different schools. You have achieved the aim. What is that aim? <laughs> Education. You understand? Mm -hmm. Now, we will now begin to tell the story and say, we don't have the school yet because we don't have the land. But we have placed them in different schools right now, in about 10 schools, on our own scholarship. I understand. Or we have discussed with the school to give us one slot in each of the schools on scholarship for these skills. Now, we have achieved the aim of giving them education. But the goal for us is that we want to create our own school where we have libraries, sophisticated library. We want to have teachers that can teach Montessori. We want to have teachers that can do practical dramas with them so that they are not only going to school, getting education, but they are also getting schools. That's your big picture. But your MVP is to first of all give them that education before you now have all of the add-ons. You understand? So yes. when you now write your proposal, they will now say, "Oh, that is what you want to achieve." So you don't want you want to educate them and also teach them what we call skills, so that they are not just only educated in school, but they also have skills that they can leverage on to be able to create income for themselves when they are out of school. Wow, fantastic! Take the money and now go and do the school. What you have done, you have skilled from that point with that money that they have given to you. That idea is called the beginning part of that idea is called the MVP, your minimum viable, viable product. product. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much. It's quite clear already. You know, um, just while you were speaking, Maureen Osage, you know, turned in a question. She was like, Sir, in a situation where your foundation has built structure, however, with the little resources we have, we are only able to reach a few beneficiaries. And I think you just answered in um, what, what you just shared. I think you just answered it when you said they should use the, the, the resources, the limited resources that you have, use it to do what you can do, right? While you are aiming at the big picture, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there's any other thing that you'd like to say. You know, someone out there who wants to start, you know, they have this idea, they want to launch out a young person, young African, who wants to start their non-profit, what, what would you say we should focus, from your own perspective, what would you say should be the first um, step to take? So I always will say something that do not start what you are not passionate about. If mm -hmm. you want to solve a problem, make sure that you are passionate because we are definitely going to go through challenges. You are going to go through very hard times trying to even raise money. But if what you are pursuing, your dream is born out of a deep passion, you want to continue to solve that problem because passion is what's going to keep you consistent. You understand? The Eureka yes. moment is what will help you solve the problem. You get? But the passion is what will keep you with, within the structures of solving that problem. So it's important for you to be very passionate. But another thing you must be thinking about is that when we say not for profit, you must understand that you should not totally think that because you are not for profit, there are not there are no elements around that you can commercialize to generate money. The idea of not-for-profit is that you are taking money from somewhere to solve a social problem, but you are not reporting profit for it. You understand? So that means that you can make money from something that you are doing to solve problem in a social context, but it's just that you are not reporting profit for it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, for example, yes. uh, um, if you are solving a problem, we are doing a social impact problem. Write books. Sell those books. In the world of digital today, create content, interesting content, put them on YouTube. Those YouTube 
we create money for, we generate money for you, which you can use to continue to improve your work in the social not-for-profit sector. So have something that will keep you sustainable, you know, and this will help you to continue to leverage and leverage more on growing your, your idea and all of that. 